Please give a warm welcome to our guest and Georgia Tech alumnus, Jeff Beach. Everything is disappointing after that kind of introduction. Um, so we'll try to give you the true, true stuff about what's, what, what we have going on. Um, it is a, a great uh, privilege and honor, and I'm, I'm humbled to be here uh, with you today. I just spent a little time uh, with a group of students. Uh, we had a great uh, exchange, and I told them, quite frankly, I'd rather just sit and talk with them than come up here and present, but we're, we'll give this a shot. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about t today. Um, and, and as a part of that, uh, Terry and Dory asked if I would give a little bit of my, you know, my own personal journey. So the warning here is I'll try to go through this as fast as I can. This is the boring part of the presentation. The exciting stuff will come in a few minutes. Uh, graduated from Georgia Tech uh, with a management degree in 87. I was a co-op and I shared with the students earlier today. I was a co-op in the most exciting, glamorous industry sector you can work in, the poultry processing industry. As I see people getting up to leave now, okay. Uh, but I, I did, I got great experience there that, that carried on and, and things I learned in that that I uh, still use today. Uh, from there, um, I was very, very fortunate to move on uh, straight into the consulting world uh, with a, a small boutique consulting, people would call it at that time. Uh, called Systicon. Uh, it was actually started uh, by a group of Georgia Tech uh, alum and uh, one of those very well known uh, uh, to a lot of people still, Dr. John White, and it gave me a, a, a great platform uh, to learn uh, and, and grow internationally. Uh, and then shortly after that, Anderson Consulting came knocking uh, because they were interested in starting a strategy consulting firm. Uh, so they tapped uh, five of us from three different uh, consulting firms to focus in an area that they at that time called logistics strategy. It then became supply chain strategy and will continue to be called whatever can get money in the door. Um, but in all sincerity, it was a great experience in 1997. I was blessed to become a partner. And then in 98, at the advent of the Euro, uh, I moved over to the UK. Uh, to look at different kinds of strategies, supply chain and beyond, that would be impacted uh, because of cross-border uh, opportunities. So when living in the UK, on a very personal level, my family and I used it, honestly, as an opportunity to, to travel to places that we might not otherwise travel. And in, uh, 19, excuse me, in the year 2000, we had a chance to take a family vacation to Kenya, which was fascinating. Uh, especially going with four kids at that time, uh, two of those at the twins at the tender age of five. Uh, and at one point in time, five days of that uh, initial visit to Kenya, we didn't even see a paved road. Um, so, but it was an opportunity uh, for us to learn uh, more about a people and a culture uh, that we would uh, basically fall in love with. Um, at that time, I also read a little book as a, as a plug for you. It's called Halftime, written by an author by the name of Bob Buford uh, with a forward by a little-known uh, professional uh, named Peter Drucker. Um, and if you don't know much about either of those uh, guys, I'll tell you, go out and Google them. They're very interesting, very, very successful business people, but business people who realized that uh, maybe there was more uh, out there to do than just business, but also real, realize that when you are working, uh, let's say, out in the nonprofit world, sometimes it's much more complicated uh, than it is even in the business world. Uh, from there, uh, in the year 2001, that is a definite year in my life of massive transition. It's a year in which Anderson Consulting ended up doing an IPO to become Accenture. It's a year in which I moved my family back uh, to the U.S. It's the year in which I looked at my partners and said, I'm leaving. Um, to which they thought maybe I needed some kind of guidance, counseling, mental uh, help, or, or some reason because I was just going to go waltzing into the world of nonprofit and, and ministry. Um, but it was, again, it was a, it was a great time uh, of transition uh, for a lot of people. Um, 
Now, with all that boring stuff behind us, let, let's talk about what's going to be more interesting. Let's talk about development. First of all, let me ask, when, when you hear somebody say that, I don't want to hear definitions of development. I want to know, give me some of your impressions when you hear somebody say development. What do you think of? How much do you want? Okay. All right. What else do you think of? Does anybody think of anything when they hear the word? This is going to be a long, power, just painful time, folks, if you're not going to help me out here. What do you think about when you hear the word development? Something being made? Making something better? Progress. Okay. I kind of gave you a little hint up here also. In the nonprofit world, we talk about development. Um, there's a reason why I put in the in next to that the parentheses versus relief or rehab or rehabilitation. Um, out in the, the nonprofit world, when people talk about relief work, I want you to think about things like disaster relief, what happens after a tsunami, what happens after an earthquake, right? There are significant major issues going on that you have to address immediately, and you take whatever action necessary to, to address that. Some people call it, it's an operation to stop the bleeding. Um, then you get into areas of rehab or rehabilitation, and that's when uh, you're not trying to stop the bleeding anymore. You're basically trying uh, to, to find a better Band-Aid, a, a way to get toward maybe even a, a cure. Where development takes you in the nonprofit world, quite frankly, is into a space that I just simply refer to as capability or capacity building. In essence, instead of going in and trying to, to relieve a disaster situation or a dire you know, situation that you know, literally tomorrow could be the difference between life and death, you're entering a situation that, that could be existing but you're there to work side by side with the group on helping them develop their own capabilities and their own capacity to solve their own issues on an ongoing basis. So when I start talking about development, that's the space that we're going to be talking about. And it just so happens that our approach to development, and there are a lot of different approaches to development, anybody who tells you that they have the best approach to development, my advice to you is turn and run. There is, there is no such thing. Um, development is highly customized depending on where you're doing it, the culture you're doing it in, and what it is you're trying to address. It just so happens, and again, I believe on just being straight with you guys, you need to know we have a very big bias on doing development based on models of collaboration. So again, here's another question for you. When you hear somebody say collaboration, what do you think of when you think of collaboration? Teamwork? Ah, respect. Working together. Working together? How about hard? Sometimes it's a little easier to work in isolation or one group or one company or one entity at a time. So collaboration, the reason why it's, it is a big buzzword right now in the nonprofit field and the foundation field and things like that for a lot of reasons, um, you don't hear a lot about it sometimes on big scale because it is hard. It, it, it really is. But the payoff is significant. I'll give you a few ideas why we believe the payoff is significant. Number one is collaboration many times is a, is a huge creator of leverage, economies of scale, duplication reduction, uh, and honestly, pretty active idea sharing. It's hard to get a group of people who have kind of a common interest, who have a like mind of going after something or trying to solve something where you don't get some pretty powerful uh, active uh, uh, idea sharing going on. But you better believe there's a lot of leverage, a lot of economies of scale uh, also that, that are available if you're willing to come into a collaborative relationship. Uh, when, we, when we say something and, and put it in the context of social development um, in a collaborative environment, we're usually talking about doing that at a community level. And the reason why that's important to, to, to think about is because it, when you think of community, a lot of times we're talking about people who 
live or work in the same general geographic area, relatively close to each other. Uh, they may know each other, uh, but at least they know the environment they're working on. They know the, the issues, the opportunities, the assets, the, the, the lack of resources that they have. So one of the, the, the things that we look at in doing development work and doing it collaboratively is looking at communities, basically looking at doing development one community at a time. Uh, some of the other things we look at when we look at a community, we, we look and say, okay, is there a track record at all in that community, any experience or at least a stated desire of working together? I, I, that sounds simple, but quite frankly, it's not that easy to find everywhere. That means people really are serious about checking their egos or their donors or anything like that at the door and instead really willing to come together and do something uh, together that's significant. It's also important for us to look at and start to get a sense in a community and a culture, do they have an interest and do they have a desire to literally move from being a consumer to a producer? Um, and, and in the nonprofit world, folks, I'll tell you, that's that can be a pretty difficult uh, leap to make because people are in need, right? So a lot of people, they're, they're in a big consumption mode. Um, but that's not always the case. You end up finding communities that have people in need where people in that community are ready to try to take on becoming producers of solutions rather than just consumers. Uh, very key for us when we're looking at situations is local leadership and ownership. Um, I will tell you, when you hear about NGOs and other groups that go into a country and they provide leadership and ownership, you, you find the, the road littered with disasters in those, not every one, but typically that can be a very, very difficult road to hoe. Local people taking responsibility Having leadership and having ownership is crucial if you're going to try to help uh, develop any kind of significant ongoing change. Uh, and, and something that somebody mentioned, respect, kind of goes hand in hand with valuing relationship. Again, as we talk through this example I'm going to share with you in, in Kenya, you, when you are in different parts of the world, different parts of the country, quite frankly, you can. it's not that people don't value relationship. It's just certain cultures and certain areas value relationship above other things, above money, above you know, prestige or power or title, et cetera. You, 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 having a, a real high value placed on relationship in doing development in a collaborative environment is very, very important. And quite frankly, it's a lot of things that, that we're about to talk about. Um, after I give you one last thing, just because I am back home at Georgia Tech, I do feel I must say something about theories, models, and tools versus reality. And yes, we, we do use some of those in, in what we do. We use tools like collaborative letters of agreement uh, between groups. Uh, we apply a, a model that, that uh, we've been working on for quite a while and is starting to get some uptake. Uh, we refer to it as equitable asset exchange. And the general idea behind it is even if someone or a group does not necessarily have money, they have some asset of value. It could be expertise. It could be contacts. It could be workforce. It can be a lot of different things. The question is, is when you're working in a, a group, can you get to a point where everybody has some asset that's being exchanged and it's being done in an equitable uh, fashion? Um, and then theories, like uh, the, we call it the triple I theory. It's the intentional intercommunity interdependence. It's actually looking at interdependence within a community as something that in certain uh, situations should be intentionally promoted so that you are less likely to become dependent on outside sources or outside uh, groups for whatever it is that, that you need. 
Having said that, I will tell you that's going to be the last you hear me talk about anything like that because none of these are worth very much uh, if they can't be understood, applied, and end up delivering real results to real people living uh, in the community. So that's where we're going now. We're going to go back to Kenya. If you remember, I told you took the family there in, in 2000 when we lived in the UK. After we started the, the foundation, we were doing some work in Latin America. We were doing quite a bit of work in Central America. Uh, but, but quite frankly, we, we had a real desire, somewhat selfish, to, to get back uh, to Kenya. And I happened to be talking to a, a, a local area pastor in the, the Roswell area here in Atlanta. And he said, you know, we've met this, this guy here. He's from Kenya. Um, he's here studying. He's got a real interesting story. Why don't you just meet him and talk to him? So uh, in 2004, I had a little sit-down uh, meeting with this guy named Zablon Karaya. Zablon uh, was born and raised in Nakuru, Kenya. Nakuru was not a place that we visited in 2000. would never even think of visiting it when, when we had our family over there on vacation. Um, but... Uh, he had a very interesting story. He was a very successful uh, insurance executive in Kenya. Um, and then uh, late in his 30s, around 40, he left it and came to the U.S., uh, was going to a local college studying things in business application and, and uh, Bible studies, quite frankly. And, and his desire was to, to take some new knowledge and new approaches back to his home uh, in Nakuru. And so I was curious. I said, what, what is it about Nakuru? What, what goes on in Nakuru? And so here's some of the things he started to share with me. First, on a macro level, certainly I didn't understand this. Uh, for several years running, Nakuru, Kenya has been the fastest growing city in all of East Africa. Um, and there's a few reasons why. It certainly isn't because it's a, it's a hot spot of commerce or anything like that. Uh, instead, it's really seen as a refuge for people who are running from oppression. Um, Kenya is bordered uh, by Sudan to the north. It's also uh, bordered uh, by Ethiopia. Uh, Kenya tends to, to, a, to attract a lot of people, and, and within its own borders, Kenyans had plenty of you know, issues on, on their own between uh, the, the tribes that still exist there, over 40 of them. But Nakuru, for whatever the reason, has tended to be a magnet of drawing people uh, in. It's kind of a place of, of refuge, and it, it continues to be a very fast-growing place because of that, but also because of that, the needs, the opportunities are very significant in size and scope. Zablon went on to tell me about a growing small group within that Nakuru community they're based on churches and other organizations that were working together side by side every day, doing things that the government there was not able to do or was not you know, going to be doing anytime soon. And he started to share with me some initial education and uh, health care projects that they had taken on. They started a little preschool uh, together as a, as a group, and they started a, an, an in-town health care clinic, and they were doing it using some pretty interesting you know, models and theories, and as I listened to them, I thought, wow, this is, this is a kind of, of, of an interesting group that's already working together. Um, Zablon being one of the leaders himself was so much of a leader, he was willing to leave behind his family to come get exposure to some other uh, education and opportunities, but his desire was to go back, and that's what he was getting ready to plan to do, was to, to go back and join back up with other leaders who, who were there um, who really had a desire to do more. They didn't think what they were doing currently uh, was enough. Um, and then, um, this, is, this is their emphasis now, not mine. I found it very interesting, though, that they emphasized relationship and partnership. And when I went there in June of 2004 and sat and listened to them, um, of course, I'm, I'm used to looking at different you know, books and theories and stories and case studies and they used a couple of examples uh, from the Bible. One was out of Acts 2. And what made it powerful was it wasn't that they were quoting Scripture. What they were quoting were the principles that they saw there of a community coming together, bringing together assets, things that they had, 
to share with each other and to take care of those, quite frankly, who didn't have uh, some of the things that they might, might have had. Not because they were mandated to do it, not because they were guilted into doing it, not because the government told them they had to do it. They were doing it because they thought that was the right thing to do. And they also talked about models of working together that they found in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because in there you'll find a story about how you know different parts of a body come together and function together. So you have an arm and a leg, and what you learn is in a body, you don't want all the parts to be the exact same. You want a variety. You want things that have a different function to come together, and when they do, new things happen and things work. So those were the principles that they were all working off of. We thought, whoa, this is, this is a powerful environment. So the reason why I'm telling you that is because it had nothing to do with us coming in and creating anything. There was, a, there was an environment in place to do something pretty special. So this is where we get into this whole topic of kind of then walking alongside them in development. But development gets customized tremendously depending on the culture in which you're involved in it, in this case, in the Kuru, Kenya. So you're in an environment. You can take some different approaches, even in development. You can do it to them. You can do it for them. You can do it with them. Any guess what might be a, an, a, an effective, successful approach? Yeah. To them. OK, yeah, perfect. In all sincerity, if you look out there in, in a lot of cases, that is what happens. I mean, that's just a harsh reality. I don't, I'm not standing up here trying to be critical or saying that we've got to bet. No, it's just people go in, they see something. If they have compassion, they want to fix it. So you end up trying to fix them. You do something to them. It tends to be a lot more damaging sometimes than doing it with them. There's a different approach. You can actually, instead of even doing it with them, you can respond to them. It's amazing what happens when you start asking questions and you start to find out, OK, these folks here have some really good ideas. Well, yeah, wouldn't you expect it? They live there. They know what they have. They know what they don't have. They know what works. They know what doesn't work. Maybe we ought to just come alongside and respond to their ideas. So that's what we did. And what we found is, hey, the Kenyan leaders, they're the ones that identified the set of issues, the potential solutions, and the required resources. Not us. They, they made those uh, initial uh, uh, identification sets. Uh, they first focused on their own local resources or assets that could be brought to bear in any of these solution areas. Only after that did they start to say, we might need to look outside for some of these other things. Um, and then key, they understood many times if you bring in people from the outside to help you, eventually those people from the outside have a tendency to go away. So if they go away, how are you going to sustain what's been done? And they recognized that, and they had some ideas on, on how to address that. Um, and one of the ideas that they addressed, that this on the surface may not sound necessarily brilliant, but i got to tell you, it's very powerful. They came up with a proposal that they wrote based on resource, cost, and revenue sharing across multiple programs and multiple projects. In other words, those that might be um, familiar with business theory about thinking about silos versus thinking, let, let's say, across or, or horizontally, that is exactly the way they were already thinking. They understood that an education project needed to focus on education and maybe a, a, a social service project needed to focus on, but they could link the two together a lot of different ways. And that was, a, that was a light bulb that kind of went off when we said, OK, they're willing to share even in revenue and cost and resources in a way that are, is going to give us all an opportunity to do some things that we haven't seen happen 
in some other places. So I'll give you a sense of how that evolved. Call it development evolution. A at the end of the day, they had an idea. They wanted to create a set of solutions co-located together on what they were going to call the Tumaini Mission Center. Tumaini in Swahili means hope. So they had this idea that you know if they co-located these things together, sharing resources would actually be a lot easier. And the first thing they wanted to do, in addition to continuing to grow the education initiative that they had started, the healthcare initiative they had started, was to first form a children's home. Their view was one of the biggest issues that they had in that particular community was the growing uh, population of orphans. At that particular time in Kenya, there were almost three million orphans uh, in that country. So it was a massive issue countrywide and very significant there in Nakuru. But quite frankly, I'm sitting going back going, so the very first thing out of the gates that you want to create new and add to this is a te technically and, and traditionally a big consumer of things. Hmm. But there's some ways that you can surround a consumer with production. So here, as we talked about that, they start going, ah, wait a second. If we did a few things, maybe we could do this. Let's take the school. Let, let's take, if we do this on a big piece of land, we might be able to actually uh, drill for water in an area that doesn't have a lot of water. And if we pick the right place and hit water, it's highly leverageable. Um, and if we're in the right place and we can do farming, that's, that's highly leverageable. And oh, by the way, we have this idea for a conference center. And I literally said, OK, I had no idea what you're talking about on a conference center. So just kind of put that off to the side. Um, and then they also said, you know, one of the things we learned is that when we started this school and we had to be able to transport children from different parts of the community, we bought an, an old, used, mostly broken down bus, but they found ways to keep it running. But between when we got the kids to school and when we took them home, why have the bus just sitting around? We're going to take it out in the community and basically hire it out, make money on it by transporting other people in the community. So they, they didn't believe in assets just sitting around. So that, that's already the way they were thinking. So they started to look at, at this and, and quickly came up and said, you know what? We do have some people in this community who, if we offer really high education, they can pay good school fees. And they put together a very aggressive program. And they felt like to cover the annual operating cost of that initial children's home, they might be able to get enough out of the school fees to shift that over and help cover about 63% of the initial operating cost for the children's home. 12% coming from water sales, if they could hit water uh, on that property, about 7% after they fed the kids from the agriculture products on site and selling it out into the marketplace. 3% if they could ever come up with this idea for a conference center, which I still was kind of looking at going, I'm still not sure I'm getting getting that yet. And then 2% from leveraging uh, more and more transportation. When you add that together, their math says, OK, that, that could, in theory, if we get this to work, cover about 87% of the operating cost of the children's home initially. What are you going to do to cover the rest of it? Well, we're going to go out to the local community because they, we think that our community, because it's Kenyan-owned, it's Kenyan-operated, it's Kenyan-led, it's helping out you know, segments of the community that our you know, community understands. We do believe local businesses, local people will support it, as well as more of the local churches. And between those two, it might seem modest, but that as it added up to be another 5%. So we said, okay, so now we got about an 8% gap to, to close. And then they, they looked at me and said, how can we get more Westerners involved? Well, it, fast forward, a simple answer is, you know, put together maybe a, a child sponsorship program. I mean, you know, Westerners, you know, tend to enjoy doing things like, you know, I, I can sponsor a, a, an orphan child in a foreign country or, or something like that. The 8% gap was a reasonable one to close. So, that was the initial economic model that 
brought in a lot of other components to it that we'll talk about here in a second. But I want you to understand, this was, this was now early in 2006. And the other thing about doing development work, especially in developing countries that you find out, is the setting changes. It does not stay the same. And we had a lot of things changing on us in Kenya, some that were very unpleasant. At the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, there was massive tribal violence all around disputes around a presidential election. Then that gave way to significant challenges in restructuring the government, which gave way to literally a new constitution for the country. During that time, we hit double-digit inflation in certain areas. We had exchange rates move 50% and 75% within a one or two year time frame. So it was massively changing, massively uh, challenging. And the Kenyans basically said, well, that means just we need to expand more development. So uh, that was very interesting and encouraging. So what did they do? Here's kind of where they ended up. They ended up with four major, they call them their four ministry areas. Some people would call these are four major uh, social area programs. Call it what you will. They come into four categories. Number one is education. Remember, they, they started with that back in 2004 with a preschool. Um, as of this past year, here's what they have. They have a preschool, a full primary school, and now a secondary school, or basically elementary and high school. And between those three, they are currently educating between 800 and 1,000 students a year. And a huge number of them are paying tuition. They are paying tuition. There's really, after uh, preschool and a little bit of primary school in Kenya, there isn't public education. And so everybody basically who goes on to the next level does pay something. Uh, so it does generate also uh, revenue, even though they provide a huge number of scholarships to, to people in need. Uh, they actually developed a vocational training center on uh, one of the churches in, uh, in uh, town campuses. And that's creating huge education and skill building uh, for adults in a lot of different areas of vocational training. And then they, they looked at the situation they had, and I remember them coming and going, you know, one of our big issues on this healthcare thing is we can't get enough trained professionals. We can't get enough trained professionals. I said, well, okay, you know, there may be some things you can do short term, but what about long term? Well, we're going to have to educate more people. Okay, what would you do about it? Well, we should create a nursing college. They did. They created a nursing college, and it's certified, and they are just now graduating their first fully certified nursing students in one of the largest medical professional companies. Uh, in the U.S. located uh, here in Atlanta and what they do, um, heard about this and said, you know, we, we love that approach. Could we do something like offer scholarships to nursing students but offer the scholarship almost, almost like a loan? And the way that the students would repay the loan, they're not going to pay the money back. Instead, they're going to agree for the three years they're in nursing school that when they come out, they will work in a community health clinic. They can be paid to do it, but they're going to work in a community health clinic where people in the community are going to benefit. Great program. It's working extraordinarily well. Second component is, again, that health care component. They had one small in-town clinic. They now have three fully operating uh, health centers with dispensaries because they do it in such a way where they qualify to be able to gain access to pharmaceuticals from the World Health Organization, USAID, various uh, groups. Um, so they are a very, very, very popular source uh, in the community. And you'll see some numbers here in, in a minute. But they also figured out that with infant mortality rates, they're very high. They really should take a look at uh, the whole area um, that ended up basically uh, having them create a maternity ward. And they were very wise in how they did it. They didn't just go out there and get any type of staff. They said, we need to staff this with 100% women because many in our culture, will, women will not be seen by a male you know, doctor. So we're going to staff it with 100% you know, female staffing. They know their environment. They know their culture. They know what will work. And honestly, they know what is going to draw more and more people 
uh, to the services that they provide. Uh, the third element is one that they classify as social and family, and again, that is where that Bethany Children's Home kind of takes its place uh, there. They now have uh, over uh, 100 orphans uh, being cared for uh, there. They also said, you know, something that kind of is creating the orphan situation, all kinds of things, but one of the things that they saw in their community was a real issue with young moms uh, getting pregnant, being out on the streets um, in really difficult situations, and many times, unfortunately, orphaning their, their kids. So they said, well, let's, let's start addressing the pipeline that's supplying the orphans. So they have a, it's a small startup program they call Nakuru 316 uh, for street moms and their kids. They actually bring them on site. They've built a home there that provides a safe environment for rehabilitation. But also, it's smart because the kids then are located where the school is. The moms are located where the farm is. The moms are also located where the orphanage needs matrons there to work. So there's employment and skill building opportunities uh, there also. Then this whole thing about this conference center. It was the, one of the things I kept, I'm hard headed at times, but I, I will learn. Uh, they, they, they said, no, Jeff, think about what's being created here. We think people are going to want to come learn about this. Okay, Tell me more about what you're talking about. We're talking about a conference center where people can come and, and learn. All right. So what they did is they created a conference center that, that has conference, meeting, and teaching facilities. And part of what people do come there is to see this model at work. But also, local Kenyan businesses and other businesses that have started to come into that community uh, from the outside, uh, from Asia, from uh, Western Europe, uh, from other parts of the world, they need off-site business meeting facilities. These guys have it, and they charge for it, and it creates a really nice revenue stream. But you're off-site, so maybe you also need guest cottages and hotel rooms. Okay? You charge for those things. They have a very, very high occupancy rate because they do everything with excellence. Oh, and you also need to be able to feed them and have a restaurant. And by the way, if you had a restaurant, you could teach culinary skills to people who need, you know, job skill training. And if you have guest rooms and hotels, you can actually start to train everything from housekeepers all the way up to professional hotel and resort management people. And we've actually already had one person who was over that part of the enterprise initially get hired out by one of the largest safari companies of all of East Africa. So in a way, it's a loss, but in a way, the model works. It kind of proves that it, that it does work. So measurable results. Everybody wants to know what, what are the measurable results. These are their measurements, not mine. They actually have Kenyan auditors now audit these numbers, and I'll give you a, a sampling of, of some of the things. And this is kind of in the priority that they set, not, not me. Uh, so people serve. Their number one thing, they want to know how many people are we serving, how many people are we touching. Um, the, the number from 2004 is very soft because they weren't doing a huge amount of data collection. The number is somewhere between 3,000 and 9,000 between the initial school and the clinic, a heavily, heavily, heavily weighted toward the clinic. Probably a little bit closer to the 3,000 to 9,000, but I tell you, we're, we're just going to say 9,000 on the upper end because when you get to 2013, the numbers that just came in about a month ago are well over 30,000. So in 2013 alone, they serve this group of partnering churches and organization in this community, all Kenyan owned and operated and led, uh, served over 30,000 uh, people last year alone. On-site jobs created. They, they are doing a lot of tracking about what happens when people go off, but they also want to know how many jobs are they creating on site. Last year they created 155 full-time paying jobs with you know, real career paths. They got a long way to go, 
Um, long way to go in, in how do you manage a workforce like that. Um, but hey, they are creating jobs. Sustainability. This was the one that was really interesting for all of us to watch. And again, now this is, we're 10 years into this. <clears throat> it was 2000, well, let me start with this. Their operating income to sustain all these programs, they are currently operating at a level of 85% of what they need annually to support all these operations is produced in Kenya. So either they produce it themselves with revenue streams that they create in these programs or other sources within Kenya. And believe me, it's not Kenyan government subsidized. There really isn't such a thing. So 85% of what they need on an annual operating uh, basis is produced locally. And it's only 15% that honestly comes from the US. And a great deal of that goes into child sponsorships, at the children's home as well as then scholarships at the at the nursing uh, school. In 2009 their total operating model, you know, when they look at their operating model they don't look at the at just the economic results for the children's home, the health care facilities, the social, the, the, the education, they look at it across. So they look at it as a whole and as a whole they hit break even with this 85-15 mix that I'm, I'm talking about uh, in 2009. And the numbers that just uh, came in and were verified for 2013, they actually created a 10% operating margin that they are reinvesting back to continue to expand the programs and quite frankly probably do a lot more on the employment, employee uh, development side. So um, they are proving that that it, that it is possible out there to, to do something like this. Um, for those who may have experience in international development or especially in doing community level nonprofit work, you know, it's, it's very, very typical that you'll go into a situation and a school system gets set up, an orphanage gets set up, a, a clinic situation gets set up, and, you know, time and time again, you see that usually to sustain it requires more than 50% of the income, the operating cost to be covered somewhere from outside of that place. So to see that hit 85% from within their own community uh, is pretty extraordinary. And it's not something we take credit for. We just kind of came alongside of them, gave them some encouragement and, and shared some ideas and stuck with them for 10 years. So um, that's it. I'm tired of talking. I'd rather have some interaction and field questions or hear laughter or Yes. Hello, my Hi. name is Siddharth. My question is, how do you use your various uh, experiences as a formal consultant in the nonprofit world? Uh, a lot of the consulting work that I did, especially toward the end of my uh, career, was based on international development, business development on an international level, um, and basically applying every single day uh, an idea that cultures are different, so people value things differently. Things don't work necessarily the way they work here in the, in the U.S. is something that I, I use each and every day. Uh, in the consulting arena, as well as making it through Georgia Tech, uh, you have to have a skill called problem solving at a, at a pretty high level. And I, I do end up using my, my problem solving skills from that uh, tremendously in people skills, quite frankly, uh, being able to, to deal with, uh, you know, people at, at pretty high executive levels when I was in the corporate world to people who were line workers in production facilities. Um, boy, I use that tremendously. Uh, out there in the field, especially uh, in this work in Kenya. Um, right here, yes. I'm Claudia. I have. Um, so you mentioned that there was a like government issues that they had, and that's why they had the development evolution, and that's how they came up with the center, and then all these things came about. So, do you think that? without having that government like issues and stuff like that, this would have been 
something right now, like it would have had evolved to being what it is now? Uh, or me, you think it, that played a role the government? Let me address that on a couple of levels. So first of all, um, this is not a political statement. It, it's just, a, it's a fact. The, the fact of the matter is in a country like Kenya, they do not have big government programs like we do in the US. So if things are going to get done in certain segments, like these four segments that they've identified, that they, they get done out in communities. They get done either in the private sector or with outside investment or with internal development. Um, if, if those big government programs would have been in place, it still could have happened. But what was clear is they could not rely on the government to do that for them. So if it was going to happen, it was going to happen because somebody was willing to pick up the mantle of leadership and make it happen. All of the government unrest, quite frankly, I think in a way solidified the idea that no time soon was that government in particular going to get to a place of being able to, to do more in that space. So I think it did motivate the Kenyan leaders. You know, we're just going to have to, to do more. We're going to have to, to believe that uh, maybe even through divine intervention, we can do more. Um, so I do think it, it helped drive them to never kind of kick back or rest um, that uh, stability or government or other solutions like that were going to fill the gaps. And that's why their whole idea with this operating margin is reinvestment. Uh, they, they think they're going to have to keep doing this for a very long time. And they're happy to do it. They, they feel like that's just a, a part of you know, what they're what they're meant to do. Jeff, here's a question. Hi, my name is Yuvraj. My question is that when you go out to have such an impact, there are a lot of other organizations and institutes that want to join in and like multiply that impact. So how do you choose that like which organizations and which institutes would have a similar impact and how do you make sure that like you remain focused on the idea that you started with? Yeah, that, that, that'll take a couple of minutes. Um, first of all, it, you know, some of these things we, we had the little check marks by, um, you know, do they, do they have experience and a desire to work across entities, to work, you know, not in their own silo? Um, uh, do they have a, a, a kind of an approach that says, you know, sometimes we have to give more than we take. Um, and you kind of think, well, in the nonprofit world, isn't that common? The answer is no, because in the nonprofit world, you're usually scratching and clawing to get donors and, and get funding and get grants just to make your own way. So the idea you might have to do that to help somebody out, yeah, that. Sometimes it's just not real attractive. So you, you look for certain characteristics, certain track record, and, and, and being cooperative and, and collaborative. Um, and yeah, I, there are times when I do, I do get a little bit concerned about our focus and you know, are, are we kind of getting pulled out of an area where we, you know, it's not our area of expertise. It's never about us feeling like, you know, we started with this, we need to stay true to this. Other than the principles that something's based on, we let go of that because we, we don't know where a, a situation, where a culture, where an environment is going to, to move to next. We, we, we let the, the people that are there define that. And we, we just, you know, again, you know, for a certain amount of time, we just you know walk along with them, and it, at some point, we probably will exit, uh, including there in Kenya, which is hard for me to think about, about quite honestly. But um, I think we're actually seeing a time of exit uh, come for us there. So, my name is Dan, and uh, following a Google search on you, I found out that you had the opportunity to be a mic man at the Georgia Tech football games. Uh, about 30 years ago. Um, so I was wondering how that experience has helped you or hindered you in your career. <clears throat> it taught me how to be humble because we were not good that year, <laughs> at least in football. Um, 
No, I, you know, it, it, anytime you're going to go out and do any, anything uh, that involves trying to rally people together, which honestly, as a Mike man, that was part of my job was try to rally the student section, even when we were honestly tying Furman in football. <laughs> so you, I learned some motivation skills. I learned how to, you know, kind of rally the troops. And no, I, you know, all of those experiences, uh, if you reach deep enough, have relevancy. Um, I don't do the cheers anymore, though. My, my kids do, but good question. Do you still go to the football games? Yes, still go to the football games. If I, my, my dad, who's um, aging and uh, in a little bit of uh, failing health, the one thing that his health always seems to recover is every Saturday in the fall. So we, it's a big family reunion for us at Tech Football Games. Hi, Jeff. Uh, I'm Isabel. And the 15% you have over there that you said comes from child sponsorships and the nursing program. Can you explain more about that? Was it the nurses from the school here in Atlanta going over there? No, let me let, I'll see if I can explain that better. So, it, so to, to generate the annual operating income that's required to run all of these, um, there are different sources of economic input. The U.S. economic input is highly focused on providing U.S. people providing sponsors for individual children at the children's home. You can sponsor a child there for about $600 a year, and that covers everything, their food, their clothing, their education, um, their medication, everything. So it's it, honestly, it's, a, it's, it's not that difficult to get people to, to sponsor an orphan child. But the other thing that, that has been very successful is we've had some people uh, with the Kenyans put together uh, kind of a scholarship or sponsorship program for people wanting to get into the nursing school. Uh, the nursing school fees, relative to their economy, are high. They're not as high as other nursing school fees, but they're still for any you know typical individual out there. They're 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 high. They're hard to pay, and so getting people from the U.S. everyday citizens, but yes, also those that are connected with the medical field who have a high value on those skills, are willing to come alongside and help provide some funds to cover that. And the reason why that, that's a part of that model, when you think about it, is one of the things that helps provide the 85% on the Kenyan side are the fees from the nursing school. So some of those fees are paid by Kenyan nursing students and their families. Some of those fees are paid by U.S. people who are basically sponsoring that person, paying their fees for them. And that's really between sponsoring an orphan or scholarshipping a nursing school student, that's where most of that 15% comes from. Hi, um, my name's Taylor, and um, I had a question. You, it seems like it's an awesome system, and I just wondered if it was being replicated in other parts of Kenya or other parts of even just in other countries, or if you, you said there's a time that you're kind of closing out, so is there like a new project that's, or a new area that you're looking to move to? One of the things we helped Zablon do, Zablon wanted to uh, start his own uh, nonprofit. It's called Rockbridge Ministries. You can go out and Google it. Rockbridge Ministries, you'll, you'll see uh, his smiling face and some information about him. One of the, the purposes of Rockbridge Ministries is to continue this model in Nakuru, but then to get it out of Nakuru, to move it to other parts of Kenya, and quite frankly, what's on his heart is to move it outside of Kenya. Um, I was sharing with Terry, it, it's not a, 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 an absolute direct application and duplication of it, but many parts of that model uh, are operating at a place called Lighthouse Village in Conyers, Georgia, where three different nonprofits have co-located on a property together. The common thing that they have are residential services for people in need. Um, and on that basis, they're sharing a lot of resources. They're leveraging uh, quite a bit. Um, 
Doing it in the U.S. is a little different than doing it in Kenya, but, but some of the principles do hold, and we're actually working with a new group on the east side of Atlanta uh, to do something similar. And if you're interested, if you if you either are familiar with or go out and Google, there's a uh, in downtown Atlanta there is a group called City of Refuge. Great model, and it is not one group. It is multiple groups, multiple nonprofits coming together to address a serious set of issues, and they share a lot of economics in that that model, and and so. Outside of things, I've spent a lot of time there. I've spent a lot of time with their CEO, Bruce Deal. Um, you're just you know, starting to get to know him a little bit, have a huge amount of respect for what they're doing. It's, a, it's somewhat of a similar model. Jeff, we've got two more questions. Hi, uh, my name is Divya, and you mentioned how we, uh, these aids of organizational aids should be working with the communities instead of for them. And I'm curious, why are there so many organizations that are currently doing that? Because you can kind of tell that it's short-term aid. And what does it take for them to change their mentality to make more of an impact? That is, it is, it's honestly, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It's a difficult question to, to answer. And part of it is uh, approaches uh, to things, even in the nonprofit arena, become ingrained. Um, and it, you know, when you have an organization that may have been doing something successfully in their minds in a way for a long time, like in the corporate world, sometimes it's very difficult to break that mold. Um, um, there, there are a lot of, honestly, there are a lot of reasons that are, are, are pretty deep. I, I think you're, you're, you're starting to see more and more um, Nonprofit groups, NGOs internationally understand that. There have been some great books written that are helping to do that. If you're ever interested in, in reading probably one of the most sought after, highly respected um, books that, that looks at this and, and the differences, subtle differences and approaches, uh, there's a book out called When Helping Hurts. Um, it is an excellent book. It has great models uh, and tools uh, that it, it showcases there um, and does a really good job of stepping on the toes of a lot of nonprofit and mission uh, organizations um, calling out what doesn't work. They, they don't pull any punches about that in the book, but it's a very good book. I wish you had some pictures because hearing the presentation is awesome, but seeing it is uh, absolutely unbelievable. And uh, as you know, I had a chance um, to visit uh, the, uh, the site um, about three years ago. And when I was there, I met a kid and I said, well, where are you from? She said, Kanyush, Georgia. And I said, well, what are you doing here? She says, well, I know this guy, Jeff Beach. And so I hadn't even known when I was visiting that that was the um, organization you were affiliated with. But um, I have uh, two, uh, two questions. Uh, of the 85% Kenya, what, uh, th there's two social businesses that really intrigue me. The Bethany Waterworks, which I saw operating. Mm -hmm. And the one that wasn't up and running when I was there, the energy part that you're putting into the grid. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, those two businesses and how much they contribute to that uh, continuing uh, sustainability? And as the close question, is there any way that a Georgia Tech student can contribute and perhaps visit and you know, what kinds of skills can we bring uh, to uh, the um, Nakuru, um, what do you, uh, Tumani? Uh, the home? Tumaini Mission Center. Yeah. All right, so let me try to answer uh, the, the, the first couple of parts, Terry. Uh, the one part's going to be real easy because it doesn't exist yet. Um, so let me talk about the one that does exist, which is the water business. Quite frankly, that business is growing significantly, and it's unfortunate that it is. It just it means that there's a significant need for water throughout the community. Um, 
they they had a, a one water truck this past year they added a second water truck uh, I believe now that water business by itself is probably contributing, I'm going to say it's upwards of about 10% uh, because their water business has evolved. They, they are selling water to individuals and communities. A, a lot of communities in places like this that don't have running water, which is most people don't have access to running water. So they in a community, they have what's called a water kiosk. And basically, it's a... It's a water station. It's a big giant water tank and people can come up, they pay a couple of shillings, fractions of pennies, and they can you know, load up a can or a jar or a jug with water and take it back home. Um, that's a real need and they'll always be supplying that, that marketplace. In fact, they were the first ones to ever go up at Gyoto, which is the community garbage dump, which how is the home to several hundred families, unfortunately, they were the first ones to ever take water to that place and make it available to them. And they did it at 25% of the market rate. Uh, but what they also figured out is through developing relationships with like Rotary locally, these Rotary people have businesses, their industrial businesses need water, and they could bulk sell water to them. So they are starting to do some things like that, which is really interesting. Uh, on the energy side, uh, we just finished an Indiegogo um, uh, campaign raising money uh, to match some funds that we have uh, to convert the entire site to solar. Uh, give or take energy, electric costs from the grid in Kenya cost about four times what it does us in the US four times in an economy where the average person makes between a dollar and two dollars a day. That's why most people don't have access to electricity. We have to have electricity at Tumaini for a variety of reasons. So uh, we've had some site surveys done, excellent candidate primarily for solar but also a little bit of wind energy. Uh, so we're, we're looking at a somewhere between a fifty and sixty thousand fifty and seventy thousand dollar investment to completely convert the entire site uh, to solar and when we do that the energy bill itself will be reduced in the neighborhood of about ten thousand US dollars a year but the exciting thing is is that we're partially through the process you know supporting the Kenyans on negotiating with the government owned uh, Kenyan electrical authority to sell the excess, which there will be, back to the grid, uh, which we don't know yet, honestly, what that is going to be like, because it's very unusual there to, to do that. But it's it's really, really exciting. Um, and you know, anybody can can get involved. I mean, you can if you go out again to the Rockbridge Ministries, go out and just Google Rockbridge Ministries um, in Kenya you'll find on there a whole list of different things uh, that, that you could be involved with, including, you know, I typically, all the way up to this past year, I'm in Kenya once every couple of months. Um, and, and a lot of times I do take, you know, individuals and teams of people who want to go. We're taking a team uh, of right now about 22, 25 people at the very end of May through the first week or so of June. Um, so there is no qualification. You just say, I'd, I'd like to go, and we talk about what, what kind of things are available. But you better believe, I, you know, like the, the school has a computer lab. So if you've got technology skills and, and patience with kids, there's all kinds of work there to do. If you have interest, um, you know, in looking at business models, there's plenty of things to, to, to do with that. If you have uh, uh, interest in, in agriculture, almost any facet of engineering, believe me, there's a, I, I tell people, it, it's, it's not a joke, you know, if, if, if you are breathing and are upright, there is something there to do. There, there, there literally is. Um, and when you look at the variety of, of things that this group and this community are taking on, it's probably not too hard to, to imagine everything from education to health care to supply uh, to, to energy to you know, working with kids to, you know, uh, construction, 
um, you know, any variety of things um, are, are, are welcomed as long as we are not disruptive and the Kenyans are in the lead and basically we're there just to, you know, kind of walk alongside and respond to them rather than doing stuff to them or for them. Okay? Thank you very much, Jeff, for coming. <laughs>